All right, party people, welcome back to the channel. It is BQ with another episode of the Power Moves podcast. So my apologies, I did not record a review last week. I'm going to be completely honest. I just didn't like the episode. So I, for the most part, I, I enjoy what happens week to week. There's usually a, at least one match that I can do without. The, the episode did nothing for me. And uh, obviously, that's not the main content uh, focus of my channel. So I just didn't want to sit there, go through the motions with an episode that I really didn't like. Uh, I, I figured I would just uh, combine it with this one here, which was a little bit better. These were not, this was not my, my favorite stretch of two episodes in the world. Um, I'm probably a little more constructive. The criticism is probably a little more constructive about the episode we just watched. The first, the first one just did nothing for me. Um, and that was the one that happened on May 20. Eighth from the power zone. Um, let's get into these results here. I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm not even going to really review the show like that, that crazy. I'm just going to kind of go through the results. And, and if I got some, some, some comments here, I will, uh, I'll throw them in, but um, it just, it didn't do it for me. So Tom Latimer, who I've said is, I, I'm not really a big fan of, uh, he, he beats Jake Sterling opening match. I didn't care. And then we get the savages, of, uh, excuse me, savages of Samoa and the kids learning about their opponents for the Crockett cup. Um, the kids don't do a whole lot for me right now, even though I think they have some potential singles in the junior heavyweight division, but I was intrigued by these savages of Samoa. I was, I was intrigued. I didn't know who the hell they were when they were announced for the Crockett cup. For the tag team tournament, but I, I was intrigued one once, once I saw them here. That intrigue, <laughs> by the time I saw them on this episode, completely went away. But um, I was interested. And then we got a uh, Daisy Kill and Talos taking on the Stew Crew. I, ha I have no interest in. I had no interest in this. I know these are all first round matches. I'm glad that. You know, we didn't get like the ukulele or anything like that to kick this thing off. Daisy Kill and Talos are okay, but um, and then the Stu Crew, I guess they're the tag champs. One of these uh territories, they were better than I thought. Like at first, I just saw they were called the Stu Crew. I'm like, who are these indie outlaws? It, it, it was okay. I just didn't really care. Again, Billy Corgan announced that Tiffany Nieves and Rekka Tahaka will take on La Rosa Negra and Ruthie J. First shot at the NWA Women's Tag Team Championship. Um, how many times are these teams going to wrestle? I mentioned that there's no way Rekka Tahaka is 6'1". Okay? She's barely taller than Tiffany Nieves. And as I said, I've, I've met Tiffany Nieves. Like, she's, she's taller. Maybe 5'8 at the max. Rick Talk is not 6'1. Let's stop. Uh, I mean, Kyle Davis is, is, is shorter than the average man, and he wasn't that much shorter than these girls. So, um, anyway, uh, then they announced that we're going to get uh, Joe Taylor versus Alex Taylor for the NWA, excuse me, uh, Joe Alonzo versus Alex Taylor for NWA Junior Heavyweight Championship coming up soon. So that'll be pretty good. The Junior Heavyweight Division is, is um, it always feels like it's the same general group of people, but they're pretty good. It stands out from the rest of the show, and that's what makes it work. It's not like, um, you know, I've talked about it with TNA with the X Division. Well, I'm like, everyone's kind of wrestling the X Division style. You go to AEW, everyone's wrestling the same style. You don't get that with the NWA. So the Junior Heavyweights do stand out a little bit. and I wasn't feeling them when they first started the division, but as I've got to know the wrestlers and, and seen what they can do, I've been a little more interested in what they do or in, more interested in the division. Southern six took on the slime balls. I call the bingo halls. I've already stated that I don't think they have a place on any kind of television televised product in regards to the slime balls. They're young, though. I mean, these these guys look like they can't be older than 19 or 20. And I'm not saying they're horrible in the ring, but I just think this gimmick is just so bad. And then we got uh, Max the Impaler versus Jake Dumas in the main event. 
So Jake Dumas, Magic Jake is actually one of my favorite wrestlers in this company. And uh, Max the Impaler is obviously so different than everybody else. I have some interest when she wrestles. She, um, God, what the hell they call it? The Lucky Seven? So she can challenge for the women's title. She's holding both television championships. I don't think it was clearly stated when they when she took on Mims. I thought it, it came off like they were combining the two titles. And then it got really weird. Then Miz, I mean, the Miz, the Miz, <laughs> the Miz, Mims lost the rematch. And I'm like, what are they doing here? You know, now, I, now I'm realizing she's defending both championships depending on who she's facing. So if that's something that I missed, I just missed it. So I, I actually like Magic Jake. Oh, to rewind what I was saying, she can she has defended the women's title seven times, so she can she can cash it in for a women's championship match at any any time. Um, I think she's only won two as far as the men. She men she beat Mims and Jake Dumas here. This match was okay. Uh, it was the only thing I had much interest in on this show. Uh, but as I said, he he's like oddly one of my favorite wrestlers in this company i like him more as the act though with with cj when he's like by himself i don't like it as much uh when, when they add cj to it i can dig it a lot more they debut this cooking with carson with carson drake here and you know when carson drake has shown up on the episode a couple times i'm like i don't really like this guy but now after watching this i can i mean i can see how someone can watch this and be like this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. It's like a little cooking show, and he's got some guests with him. He had um, um I'm going off the top of my head, Miss Star, um, Ella Envy, uh, shit, Zion, and um, what's his fuck that I the guy that I always say I don't like, Austin Idol. There was some weird like sexist humor in it. And a couple of the jokes missed and a couple landed. I think it was Ella Envy that said, have you ever had a girlfriend before? And he's just like, I, I've had a couple. <laughs> I mean, the way that he delivered that line was really natural. He's, he's a natural speaker. Um, I've, I've, I'm like I said, I can see why someone looks like this, looks at what or watches this. This little like, cooking segment that he has guests with and says, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. But I, I I was kind of entertained with it. And I can see a little bit of promise in this dude as, as far as a talker. He looks like he kind of has the it factor. It's just a matter of, of finding it. But just based off this got me more interested in him than what I've seen in the ring. But now that I I can I can put this to the, the face and to the wrestling – I have a little more interest in, in, in Carson Drake. So um, interesting stuff, man. Interesting, interesting. So let's get to this next episode. Um, this was a little bit better, but um, there were still some misses. There's still there's just still some misses. I think that the 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 debut on CW was their first it was their best episode of the year. Um and uh, there was one or two others. I, I think it was the very first one for Hard Times. It was very good as well. And then every other every other episode seems to have one match you care about, one you might care about, and one you don't care about. This one, um, the mat, the the card they put together was a little bit better, uh, and they kicked it off with a little pretty empowered promo video. Well, I think it might have just been um, uh, Kylie and, and Ella in it. I'm not sure, but it was good. The, the, the episode is always better when you have these girls involved. They're, they are one of the star elements of this show. And when you go three, four weeks without them, I think that's – I don't think you can do that. I don't think they should um, somewhat fucking be on this show. So first round, we get this is a Crockett Cup first round match. It's the Country Gentleman versus the Savages of Samoa. So as I said earlier, when Savages of Samoa did their little interview with Kyle Davis last week, which again, where where's May Valentine? Like, let's get May on screen. But anyway, 
Savage of Samoa did this, and they said, well, they're part of the the lineage of the all the Samoan wrestlers that seem to be in every company. Actually, they're only in one, but I was intrigued. You got this one guy, he's a lot smaller, he's fat, and then you got the bigger, uh, you know, for lack of better term, bodyguard type. And everyone's a son of Sika and and whatever. Yeah, my God, this family. But anyway, I saw these guys. I said, you know what? I kind of want to see them wrestle next week. So we get this match with, with the country gentleman who I don't care care about. And the Savages of Samoa were the sixth seed here. Okay, so the country gentlemen win this match, and this is considered an upset because they're the eleventh seed. They were trying to justify why they were the six, and it made no sense. Billy Corgan was on commentary, and I said this when I reviewed the last episode. It's better when he's on commentary because he provides backstory and information that the others don't. So I, I like him on commentary. He's doing all this Crockett Cup stuff. Uh, these qual- I guess it's the tournament matches, not the qualifiers. The tournament matches, but he gives backstory where where otherwise it would be completely lacking. So I appreciate that when he's on commentary. But anyway, this match starts, and I'm interested in these Samoan savages. And the the shorter dude is just pacing around with one of the country gentlemen for what seemed like an eternity. I wanted to see these guys come out the gate and beat the shit out of them. I wanted to see the Savages of Samoa destroy these guys in about four minutes because it would have given a little bit of shock factor. My assumption was that the Savages of Samoa were the lower seed, and they weren't. So you couldn't even tell that story, but you could have told a a much better upset story, but with these guys just coming out, beating the shit out of them and coming off like they were called the Savages. And I saw nothing. They're, They're, you know... They were getting taken off their feet multiple times. Um, two guys who you who you're kind of like, yo, they shouldn't be taken off their feet. They're but by a, by a team that's not really that over. I mean, the fans kind of like them, the country gentlemen. They're not really that over. Like, I I just thought this, the the Samoans should just come out and beat the absolute crap at them. It was a very competitive match. The match went way too long. And then the country gentlemen end up winning with a fucking clothesline. So this really turned me off out the gate because I thought I knew what I was about to watch. And that wasn't what I saw at all. I can see why these guys are not wrestling in a bigger company. Not to say they might not one day. I still have a little bit of interest in them. They got a good look. But here they were kind of treated like jobbers. and They didn't do anything to stand out there. It was just kind of like, Hey, we're the Samoans. Here's our look. And then the bell rang and they gave us nothing. Kyle Davis interviews AC three and the King bees along with DJ drew from one Oh two five, the bone TNA is doing something similar to where they're getting personalities on screen so that, uh, you know, it, it can, the product can look a little more popular than it really is. And that's a, that's a fine strategy. I thought, EC3 here. EC3 is one of my favorite wrestlers in the world. He's my son's favorite wrestler. EC3 is is just did not look like a star here, standing behind the King Bees. He just seemed like a dude, and it's so weird because he used to come off like such a star on television, and he just doesn't. And I love EC3. It, I I say that with with pain in my heart because I, I want to see him come off like a star. Um. And I, they set up a match here. This was, was scripted promo, just just re- reciting rehearsed material. Uh, you know, taking jabs at each other. EC3 said, "You have a face for radio." And of course, this guy came right back with the comments, and it was it just wasn't very natural. And EC3 says, "We have something here where you have to. You can't compete. You need to find a surrogate." Like, what, where the hell did that come from? And this guy, of course, on the ball is like, well, I, I met someone today. Uh, he goes by the name of Wrecking Ball because he doesn't know, um, you know, t- he probably didn't remember his last name is Ligurski. And we're going to get a title match. EC3 defending against Wrecking Ball Ligurski 
indie outlaw wrestler. Uh, they're they're not my. I'm not into the fixers, man. I'm not into that team. If you haven't guessed by now, like half this roster does nothing for me. Half the other half, I feel great about. I, I love the other half of the roster. It's just that I always seem to only get one or two of those people on an episode that I like, and then the people I don't like seem to dominate the damn shows. Uh, they did a video package that I, I I like that they always show. You know, they're doing the return of the territories. They always say where their territories are, who's going to be comp- uh, appearing at them. So I dig that. Then we got cooking with Carson again. Uh, this was with my favorite, the Slime Balls, and then they had Natalia Markova, who I love, Brian Idol, who I like quite a bit as well. I think he's in the wrong era. Like if this dude was like late '80s, in the early '90s. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think he could really be somebody, but but Brian Idol, I like him too. Um, and they do the cooking show, and he's showing him how to properly season chicken. You know, he wasn't doing the the sexist, you know, rant with with Markova like he was doing with Ella Envy the week before. This one was a little bit better, and again, it's like randomly entertaining. It's not that long. <laughs> it just it kind of gets you into this Carson Drake dude. So uh I'm looking forward to, to next week. And my favorite, Kyle Davis interviews uh Black G's and Mims. Uh, this, yo, I love Mims. I love Black G's. Putting them together was is great. I'm waiting for the next step in Mims. He did the heel turn, and then it was like, I think he wrestled again the next week and he was wrestling like a baby face. I said, what the fuck is going on here? Um, putting him with black Jesus. Great. And black Jesus just came back from beating cancer and, and surviving it, surviving a gunshot wound. And he's coming back as a heel. I love it. Uh, so black Jesus is going to manage Mims. This is a great pairing. Mims is one of the dudes uh, that, that should be at the top of this company. He's gotten there. I didn't, when he first wrestled, Uh, When they first debuted, I was just like, he just looks like a big dude, you know, like he didn't do anything for me. And now uh, he's come such a long way. It genuinely hurt me in the heart when he lost a TV title to to uh, Maxi Impaler and lost the rematch like that genuinely hurt me. I was like a a stab wound, Um, but I'm really high on him. Mims is great. Then Tom Latimer, who, who, again, I don't really care for his accent. I thought, dude, who said it? It might have been Russo or some you know this other days. Like everyone has an accent now. You know, it used to be something where you really stood out if you had one. Now, now everyone's got a, got an accent. But I just I've never enjoyed Tom Latimer's promos, his promo style, his delivery. He's got a great look. Looks like a million bucks. Uh, when he was Bram in TNA, I, I thought he just did better as a silent partner. You know, um, obviously he's achieved higher heights with the NWA as far as his uh, championship pedigree. And that's better for him. I'm just saying, I don't really like listening to him talk, but he's going to take on Zion here soon, which which is interesting because Latimer just got the time, excuse me, just got the title, but Zion's undefeated. So I, I would have preferred this when Latimer had been the champion for several months and then you get Zion at you know, at one of the big shows. And then it's like, whoa, who's going to win? You know, um, I just, I don't like him defending against someone of this caliber win loss record wise. uh, So early in his title reign. And then we got something here. This was one of the worst. Let me scratch my head first. So man. Okay. We got to go back to last week because that's when they at, when when um when when Jax Dane I, and I, I didn't talk about this at the top of the show he he has announced that Tim Storm who did a random fake heel turn like it's not believable at all is it interesting yes because you have to do something different and new with Tim Storm at this point like what you have to okay so it's interesting. Does it come natural for him? Not at all. Like that was one of the worst heel turns I've ever seen in wrestling, but I'm not turned off by it because it's not, that's not his thing. You know what I'm saying? 
So you got to give him, you got to give him some grace, give him an opportunity. Maybe he's gonna gonna make this work. And I like Jax Dane a lot. He was Jax Dane was rambling on for what seemed like five minutes about Tim Storm is now gonna be Baron Von Storm, and that he has a sickness where he doesn't know who he is, but he knows who he is in the ring. This was it was so fucking bad. It was awful. And I like I like Jax Dane, so I, I hate seeing him have to do something like this. And I, I'm not gonna completely write it off. He, like he it, it, again, Jax Dane's promo explaining this was so nonsensical that it, it, it just didn't end because like if it would have made sense, he could have he could have delivered this in two minutes. He's just dragging on and on and you know, they do a video package highlighting Tim Storm and his new persona here. He's Baron Von Storm. Like, what the fuck is this? I'm going to try to have an open mind because, as I said, you got to the point where you have to do something new with Tim Storm. Like, he probably should have retired a long time ago, but he's still wrestling. So you got to do something different with the dude, obviously. He did. He was great when he was a champion. He was great when he was feuding with, um, what's his tits? Uh, WWE. Uh, why am I forgetting his name? He was the most prominent figure on this show for the longest time. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Mickey James fucking husband. I don't, I don't know why the name is escaping me. That's very embarrassing. So I apologize for it, but they had a, you know, they had a good thing going there. And then he, he went on commentary. He was awful. Him and velvet sky sky were, he wasn't as bad as velvet sky, but he was very bad. And now he's back in the ring after the, I think he he did have a retirement angle, but this this looks so bad so far. But I'm gonna give it an opportunity. The Immortals took on the kids. Um, the kids are pretty good in the ring. They're tiny. They probably beat jobbers as tag a tag team forever. So I think they would just be better off as singles in a junior heavyweight division because they can go, but they're very young. Uh, the kids is a horrible name. But they're not that bad. They're not. They're, they're not bad. But they got some. They got a little bit of work to do. They're a good team to invest in for the future. But uh, I, I just think they're better off as singles. I mean, neither of them have personality. That's not. That's not what I'm getting at. But the junior heavyweight, you don't necessarily have to have that. You know, it's kind of about the wrestling. Um, and they embrace you being smaller in the division. This went on entirely too long. The Immortals should have destroyed them. And they didn't. It was entirely too competitive. Um, I like both of these guys. Odinson looks like a million bucks. He looks like two million bucks. Like this is. Uh, I mean, he's a very. He looks like Hammerstone out there. But this guy, when the time is right, you can really hit your wagon to this dude. You got to change his name though. He can't be Odinson. That's a horrible name. It's okay for a tag team. It's okay for someone in the middle of the card. He can be your champion one day. He can be the guy, and he can hold that for a long time, and it would be believable. Again, looks like two million bucks. His work is good. He has some unique offense. He did the he did the torture rack where he has him in a torture rack, lifts lifts him, slams him, and then does a leg drop immediately. That should have been the finish of the match. But it kept going, and then they do their their version of the Doomsday Device, which is a good move too. Um, but this guy is such money, and he's kind of—I don't want to say he's wasting away in the tag division. He's not. He's a part of a prominent team. He's had championship gold. I remember he was a part of another team in the NWA, and I can't remember for the life of me who his partner was. I don't think that guy's around anymore. Um, but Odinson is. He just looks like two million bucks, man. Like once you 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 fine tune this dude, uh, get him out of this kind of like gladiator gimmick thing, you, you're gonna have something here. Like this, this no shit can be your guy one day, your champion, um, and he can be. A, he's good enough to be on any wrestling show. I, th- I think he's awesome. Kyle Davis back again interviews EC3, and he's with Dory Funk Jr. Dory Funk Jr. is a legend, but they like to bring these old guys on the screen. And your target fan base should not be people who want to see 
Torrey Funk Jr. You understand? Um, but it is that <laughs> that is their target fan base. Fan base. And they they talked. I didn't care. Um, main event time. Something I did care about. I was really looking forward to this. Um, oh, I was I was laughing. Dory Funk was doing the the old man handshake where you shake their hand and then they they continue to hold it for like thirty seconds for no reason as they talk to you. That's what he did to EC3. We got a number uh, number one contender for the women's championship match. Remember, Kenzie Page is the champion. Two of her girls, her sister and her partner, are in this match, and you had Ella Envy against Taylor Rising and. Kylie Page. Um, first of all, Taylor Rising is really good. They used her in in TNA as Terror Rising. She was a jobber. And I remember when I was watching those episodes and reviewing them, I said, yo, I kind of want to see more of her, actually. I don't remember who she was wrestling, but I was like, I'm more interested in her. She comes over here. Um, she's got a great look, great physique. She's she's there were some sloppy moments in this match. They were paint by numbering a little bit or dance by numbers. You know, um, I put my foot here. You put your foot there. You know, let me get your arm. Uh, you know, Napoleon Dynamite. Let me uh, snap the wrist. Give me your wrist. Yeah, not that wrist, the other wrist. You know, there was a little bit of that in this match. But Taylor Rising is very good, very athletic. Um, she, again, is someone, as I was saying with Odinson, like she can she can head this, head this division up one day. And that's what I love about the NWA's women division is that they always they have people that you can envision holding the gold one day. You're not like so top heavy. You got people where you know you, when the men, the Odinsons, the Mims, the Blake Troops, like these guys, you're like I can legitimately buy them being at the top one day. They have that with the women too. You can legitimately buy Taylor Rising being at the top one day. Um, Kylie Page, Ella Envy, maybe even Missa Kate, some of these girls, Tiffany Nieves, like you can Im- imagine them being the champion. So th- um, even though this was a little dance by dance by numbers, um, I was really into it. They ha- we haven't had a good women's match in a long time on the show. So, uh, you know, the story here, though, is that, you know, Kenzie Page, I guess initially this was supposed to be Taylor Rising versus Kylie Page. And I don't know what Kenzie Page was going to do if Kylie won, because then all of a sudden Ella Envy got inserted into this and everyone's up in arms. The storyline is not being delivered very well right now. Uh, Miss Star came out and she's now the manager of Ella Envy. Like we knew Ella Envy was going to win the match. But Miss Star is the, the manager now. What makes sense now is that Pretty Empowered, they lost the tag team titles to the King Bees and the rematch. And then it was just kind of like, what are they doing? Because as I said, the episodes are best when they're involved. And I'm like, why are they losing? What is going on here? Now it's making a little more sense. They feel like the next step might be to break Ella Envy off. I don't think they should be going there yet, but if that's what they want to do, to freshen things up, that's fine. So we're going to get Ella Envy taking on uh, Kenzie Page. I don't think Ella Envy is going to beat her. I think she's the least talented of the three. Um, she she rolled up Kylie Page uh, for the win after Kylie Page had had a, a Taylor Rising beat. So I'm interested. I'm interested, but um, at the same time, I wasn't ready for them to break off. And at the same time, I don't think the story's been being told that well so far. And again, to reiterate what I said earlier, Billy Corgan on commentary is an asset because he's he's just adding backstory and, and perspective and stuff that is really missing from the commentary, if I'm being honest. I don't hate the commentary on the show. My, my biggest knock is that it doesn't get more serious as the show progresses, which is not that big of a deal on power, but when you've got like a pay-per-view and the commentary is still very silly um, by the main event, that's the issue I have. Like Josh Josh Matthews, and um, what the hell? Uh, Don Callis, I hated them on commentary for TNA. But, I mean, it was all jokes and bad jokes. But in the pay-per-view, it was like they would get it out of their system as the night progressed. And then by the time you got to the main event, they're just calling the action and they're passionate and they're into it. We're missing that from the commentary in NWA. It's the same 
style from match one to match three or to match four, or if it's a pay-per-view to match seven or eight, it's it, nothing changes. And um, there's just so much joking and stuff going back and forth that you're losing context to, to help tell the story. Billy Corgan has, has been providing that. So that is going to do it for me. Um, decent show. Like I said, decent. Uh, the, the, the first episode here from, from the 28th was kind of got a thumbs down for me, but this, uh, this one from June 4th got back on track a little bit, even though I thought the tag team matches went entirely too long. I uh, didn't agree with one of the winners. And then the other one, I did agree with the winner, but they should have just won a lot easier than they did. That's going to do it for me, folks. And this is the Power Moves Podcast. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.